Okay. All right. So it's 802. So we'll um, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for, for joining tonight for this installment of the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. We have a special session tonight of an over athlete symposium with a great panel of speakers. Um, so we will go ahead and get started. So just want to plug the next lecture before we get started here. So January 26th, next Wednesday at 8.30, osteochondritis test cans with Peter Fabricant from HSS. And so tonight, as I mentioned, this is our overhead athlete symposia that'll go from eight o'clock now until 10 o'clock tonight. So we'll have five 20 minute talks and then a 15 to 20 minute question and answer session at the end to, to talk about what we've discussed. The speakers tonight will be myself, Kayla Holtz, um, Amy Liu, Jason Zrebski, and uh, Kevin Wilk. So we'll begin with the biomechanics of the overhead throwing for the CAQ uh, with Kayla Holtz. She's a clinical assistant professor of PM&R at University of British Columbia. She was a pitcher for Team Canada softball and won the silver medal at the 2003 Pan Am Games, was fifth place in the 2004 Athens Olympics, and she played uh, collegiate softball at UMass Amherst. So after Dr. Holtz, we'll go to, well, that wasn't right, Dr. Amy Liu, uh, who will discuss common injuries in the overhead athlete. She's an associate clinical professor at University of California, San Diego Department of Family Medicine, Division of Sports Medicine, and assistant, uh, assistant director of the UCSD Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship. She's also an associate team physician for the San Diego Padres Major League Baseball team and is a team physician for U.S. figure skating, which currently has her in Estonia, where it is three o'clock in the morning. Well... After Dr. Liu, uh, I will go, I'll discuss upper extremity peripheral nerve injuries and throwing athletes. So I'm currently at, at Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm the director of the baseball medicine program here at Emory. And I'm blessed to be able to work with, with some great uh, baseball teams, the Atlanta Braves and Georgia Tech baseball. I also play college baseball at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Following me will be Dr. Zaremski who will discuss prevention and prediction of overuse injuries and workload in the overhead athlete. So Dr. Zaremski is a clinical associate professor of physical medicine, rehabilitation, and sports medicine at the University of Florida Department of pm &R and orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. He's the director of the University of Florida Throwers Clinic, also co-medical director of the adolescent and high school sports medicine outreach program. And Dr. Zaremski played collegiate baseball at Emory University here in Atlanta. And lastly, we are very lucky and very honored to have Dr. Kevin Wilk joining us tonight. So he will be talking about rehabilitation principles in the overhead athlete. I think if you ask anyone that is familiar with sports medicine, especially baseball medicine, you ask for one physician, they're going to say James Andrews. And if you ask about one physical therapist, they'll say Dr. Wilk. And so we're very lucky to have him tonight. He's the Associate Clinical Director of Champion Sports Medicine in Birmingham, Alabama, Director of Rehabilitative Research at American Sports Medicine Institute, as well as an Assistant Professor of Physical Therapy at Marquette University. He serves as a rehabilitation consultant to a number of professional sports teams, including the Tampa Bay Rays and Chicago White Sox. He's also received the James Andrews Award for Achievement in Baseball Science. So with that said, just a couple housekeeping items. Again, this is to serve as an adjunct to the fellows individual programs education to help assist in CAQ exam preparation. Everyone would make sure your device stays muted, turn off your video, submit your questions to the chat function, and then we'll have the Q&A session here at the end after all of our lectures. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Holtz to begin to, uh, tonight's symposium. Mute. Okay. Can you hear and see my hear me and see my slides? Perfect. All right. Thanks, Dr. Bowers, and to the team for the invite um, to present today. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet, just because <clears throat> uh, there's lots of other important things to discuss when it comes to baseball, softball, and overhead medicine. But thought I'd take us through a brief biomechanics of overhead throwing for the CAQ. 
Uh, this is a picture of our baseball facilities here at UBC, and I had the pleasure of working with them as a fellow. And uh, in my clinical practice, I see um, both, I see kind of overhead athletes intermixed with other consults. I have nothing to disclose. Today, I'm going to describe the phases of pitching for both baseball and softball, highlight where injury risk is highest, <clears throat> review why and how pitch biomechanics may break down and how this puts the shoulder or elbow at risk, and then discuss biomechanics similarities between pitching, volleyball spiking, and swimming. Uh, we have a nice uh, indoor facility here that um, baseball and softball both use. This is just a shot of that. So when we're talking about overhand baseball pitching, <clears throat> you can break the pitching motion into six phases, the wind up, stride and early arm cocking, late arm cocking, arm acceleration, deceleration, and then follow through. Um, so this is uh, the video of that minor league guy. So this is his him at full speed. <clears throat> he asked me to try and identify any kind of inefficiencies in his pitching motion. Um, so this is the wind up phase where the pitcher is balanced on his uh, back leg um, until max knee height is achieved. Then the hands split apart, uh, stride and uh, early cocking begin. The front leg goes down and forward. Shoulder starts abducting and externally rotating to about 60 degrees when the foot comes down. <clears throat> the front foot should land slightly towards third base um, and point slightly inward optimally. Um, and then at that point, <clears throat> uh, late cocking occurs. So the pelvis starts rotating. You can see his back knee, just with an eye of faith, his back knee starts rotating and internally rotating from the femur. Then his pelvis starts going, you get some hip shoulder separation there, just like he's, you would in hitting. Uh, trunk starts rotating, he achieves maximal uh, external rotation in this late cocking position. Um, and then the elbow extends <clears throat> uh, and the shoulder and arm internally rotate and he follows through. I'll show you the same from the front here. <clears throat> Thanks Dr. Bowers for this video. So this is a video of a, a collegiate pitcher from the front. Um, he's, got a, he's got a pretty good motion, I'd say. A little, I'll show you one thing maybe that he could do a bit better, but um, how hard is this? I'm curious, Dr. Bowers, how hard this kid throws. Don't feel like you need to answer right away, but be curious. Um, so he's on his back foot here, balancing. Knee comes up to height, full height. His arms start um, breaking apart. Knee comes down and forward. Don't worry about his glove and his pitching arm. Um, that's just style points. Then his front foot lands. <clears throat> um, we're into this kind of early caulking phase uh, with his, his uh, arm externally rotated um, and abducted. And then his pelvis rotates, his trunk rotates. He gets into full 180 degrees of external rotation, his arm extends and then shoulder internally rotates as part of acceleration at this point. So late cocking, acceleration where your arm, uh, elbow extends and arm internally rotates, follow through across the body and deceleration. Um, so I'll stop sharing that and I will go back to my slides. So this is just a summary of what we were talking about <clears throat> with the video there. Um, and the key uh, point um, or like phase of the pitching motion to be aware of and really kind of zone in with your eye, train your eye to see is that um, maximal external rotation, acceleration, deceleration um, sequence um, at maximal ex um, external rotation in that late caulking phase, that's when you might see shoulder pain due to internal impingement, um, which will be discussed later. Uh, during the acceleration phase where you get that 
elbow extension <clears throat> and then forceful internal rotation. That's when ulnar collateral ligament stress is the highest. And then over the deceleration phase, the distractive forces are the highest. Um, and you get uh, shoulder pain often due to traction on the biceps anchor. So softball can be broken into the same six phases. For some reason, it's always been published on the analog clock, but you can apply the same kind of um, stride preparation or caulking acceleration and deceleration paradigm to softball. We'll just go through that same sequence again. <clears throat> so this is actually a video of myself at um, the MGH biomechanics lab. I had um, the pleasure of giving a talk there and uh, then <laughs> they talked me into strapping on the uh, markers and we did some pitching, which was really cool for a study of theirs. Um, so this is a just a straight fastball from the side. <clears throat> and this is in about 50% full speed here. Um, so uh, you're looking at initially this stride is, or uh, the wind up is when the arms are swinging back till their furthest point back. And then the stride begins with the left leg, in this case, striding out and forward. <clears throat> um, at landing should be slightly towards first base and the toe is turned slightly inwards. Uh, when the front foot hits, the, the arm is in about 150 degrees of um, abduction and should be maximally externally rotated. The arm then remains relatively straight, about 10 degrees of elbow flexion through the whole pitching motion, <clears throat> through acceleration, uh, and then finally ball release after a forceful internal rotation, uh, follow through, um, and the deceleration motion kind of um, across the body or in, the, in line with the ball. Um, let me just stop share and show you guys from the front. This is that same uh, image, but um, from a frontal view here, again, 50% speed. And it's always important to get a side view and a, at least a side view and a front view, um, a view from behind the, the uh, picture can also be quite helpful, but these side and front views can be, that's kind of the minimal requirements if you're doing a biomechanics assessment. Uh, so arms come down, that's the end of the windup, then the stride, <clears throat> landing, arms should be at about 150 degrees, then the pelvis rotates first before the um, trunk starts rotating, arm is pulled forcefully down, <clears throat> um, maintaining elbow extension, and then right at the end you can see there's a forceful internal rotation movement of the arm and then follow through and deceleration. We will go back to this one. Okay. So the wind up, the pitcher is balanced on the back foot. Oops. Stride front leg goes up and forward. The landing position I highlighted. Uh, like baseball, um, you get some pelvic rotation followed by upper trunk rotation. The elbow stays relatively extended and then the actual acceleration phase is elbow extension followed by forceful internal rotation. <clears throat> and you do get a lateral trunk tilt uh, towards the throwing shoulder rather than away in softball. Uh, injury risk is highest uh, in a similar uh, pattern to baseball. When um, the pitcher, when a softball pitcher is in maximal external rotation, um, they, uh, probably put themselves into a position of internal impingement. Um, and then through acceleration, unlike baseball, where forces are highest at the elbow, forces are highest at the shoulder, um, probably due to an eccentric low through the biceps and traction on the biceps anchor. And then like baseball, in deceleration, distractive forces are highest, and you get some shoulder pain probably again through traction of the biceps anchor. Um, softball and underhand pitching is not safer than baseball pitching. It's a common misconception that's kind of perpetuated by um, travel ball culture. 
Um, forces at the shoulder are similar um, between softball and baseball. It is probably safer for the elbow, but certainly not for the shoulder. And there's similar risks between the two sports for overuse injuries. Um, this is just a slide to highlight that, you know, in order for you to be mechanically efficient, there needs to be a stable kinetic chain kind of setting up the efficiency of the shoulder elbow hand and inefficiencies in the in the kinetic chain have been shown to be associated with lower ball velocity as well as increased injury risk. Um, whenever I'm looking at pitchers and mechanics breakdown, um, I first look to glute strength. And so glute, glutes really do set up proper kinetic sequencing. You can see if you had a weak glute medius, it'd be really hard to balance on the back leg um, and uh, maintain balance long enough to be able to get the front or stride foot down. So glute me med weakness often results in a shorter stride or a stride offline. Um, and right from the get-go, the kinetic chain is um, disrupted. Um, I love this idea that the scapula kind of funnels forces from the lower body through the arm and wrist. And so in overhead sports, <clears throat> there's often an imbalance between the periscapular muscles that uh, may disrupt this force funnel. And this force funnel is important because if shoulder um, biomechanics are, are in the shoulders functioning properly, then the shoulder actually functions like a screw and a washer, whereby compressive forces, <clears throat> as the arm is kind of um, moved through acceleration, compressive forces at the shoulder are dispersed by the labrum. If you have a shoulder that's a little you know, rotated in an anterior rotated position, or if there's um, you know, an injury to the labrum, then you could have increased shear forces over the shoulder joint and the load disbursement is changed. Um, <clears throat> and so that force funnel can't be as efficient. Uh, I'll just uh, highlight this again by saying if people, if someone presents with shoulder pain, an overhead athlete presents with shoulder pain, it's probably not the shoulder that's the problem. Um, it's probably, you know, farther back along the kinetic chain, improper sequencing, usually between the pelvis and the trunk um, is the culprit. And so I thought I'd just quickly run through volleyball and swimming. So 20% of overuse injuries in volleyball are to the shoulder. <clears throat> and uh, during a spike motion, shoulder abduction and external rotation followed by a forceful extension and internal rotation motion is similar to um, overhead throwing. And so the same injury risks um, and mechanisms apply. Um, shoulder pain is also really high in collegiate swimmers. <clears throat> and so that same kind of initial out of the water shoulder abduction, external rotation to initial underwater uh, entry where the shoulder internally rotates and adducts uh, would predispose them to um, injury if their kinetic chain is um, impacted. Uh, so um, while you might have shoulder pain um, as the presenting complaint, there's probably an issue with the force funnel and most commonly it's from an imbalance in periscapular muscles. <clears throat> and as, as I'm sure Dr. Wilk will discuss at the end, much of rehab is um, applying the right mix of strengthening and neuromuscular training. So that was a whirlwind multi-screen tour <laughs> through the phases of pitching for both baseball and softball. Uh, injury risk is highest at that um, acceleration, deceleration phase. Uh, pitch biomechanics break down usually because there's a, a, a mismatch in um, periscapular muscles or because the shoulders lead the hips at um, foot strike. Um, and all of these overhead motions have similarities in that you, they go, uh, athletes go from shoulder abduction and external rotation to a forceful internal rotation motion. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out obviously on the chat or by email. And um, sometimes I'm still on Twitter. I don't know about you, Dr. Bowers. <laughs> I've noticed that you aren't on this much anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks Dr. Holtz. So uh, Dr. Amy Liu uh, will go next to discuss some common injuries in the overhead athlete. All right, so let me share my screen. All right, can you guys see my screen okay? 
And then if I do this, hopefully you guys see the actual presentation and not the notes. All right, well, um, thank you, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Zarensky for inviting me to uh, talk on our discussion panel today. Um, I really appreciate Dr. Holtz's uh, breakdown of biomechanics. I really feel like understanding the biomechanics of really all aspects of sport and injury really create the foundation of how we can uh, appropriately treat and manage our, our athletes. So um, I'm just going to discuss sort of a co common injuries in the overhead throwing athlete and um, give just sort of a basic overview of the things that we'll see um, and some of the less common things that you may not think about when it comes to overhead athletes. I don't have any disclosures. So, you know, we can look at it first and what, what really defines an overhead athlete? What kind of activities um, would you consider to be part of an overhead uh, type of sport? Baseball is pretty easy to identify, softball as well. Um, I'm really glad that Dr. Holtz brought in volleyball. Uh, tennis is a, another very common overhead, repetitive overhead motion that we can see in our athletes. Uh, I started looking into football, water polo, swimming as well. Uh, started to consider lacrosse uh, amongst other things. Um, one, one of the things I learned in fellowship was it's always fun to bring a little bit of history when we talk about uh, any, any kind of case or, or injury. And so, you know, when we look at why, you know, why do we get so many, um, injuries when we are talking about the overhead throwing motion overhead activity? And if you look at the way that our skeleton has developed compared to our more, um, you know, primate ancestors, you know, you look at, uh, when we look at, um, the primates spend a lot of time, um, their arms overhead, uh, lots of overhead swinging and repetitive swinging actions there. The way that their shoulder girdles, um, uh, the way that we have evolved from their shoulder, shoulder girdles kind of explains a little bit of these mechanics. Um, primates have a much more globular humeral head and their, and their glenoid is really redirected more upwards rather than lateral compared to us. Um, they have more a, a more elongated scapula as well as an elongated uh, acromion and coracoid process, and that provides kind of a much more stable um, joint to support uh, lots of repetitive overhead um, activities. We look at, um, oops, let's see. Okay, then as we look at how our shoulder joint has evolved, um, our glenoid is really more directed laterally than cranially. Uh, we have a much shorter acromion and uh, coracoid processes. Um, so it really provides a little less stability uh, when we um, talk about repetitive overhead activities. And anatomically, the, the acromion has now created more of a roof rather than a like stabilizing buttress when we are uh, participating in overhead motion. Uh, the scapula as well tend to move a little less in a cranial caudal motion and kind of a little more in medial lateral rotation. Um, I, again, part of, part of what, uh, what we like to teach in fellowship is, you know, when we talk about um, assessing uh, injuries and, and coming up with diagnoses, it's, it's one thing to, to come up with the what um, uh, or, you know, what the diagnosis, but a, a big part of it is the why. And so I'm really glad Dr. Holtz had an excellent um, overview of the mechanics. And so I had thrown in a few slides to kind of look at some of those mechanics. So just like she had reviewed, we've got um, a lot of different phases in uh, the baseball pitch uh, where it comes to, where it talks about your um, kind of your wind up uh, as well as your, your cocking or loading phase. And then you have acceleration, deceleration and follow through. And as we see with some of the other sports, very similar in terms of those phases, like she mentioned, um, wind up acceleration, um, uh, wind up and sort of a loading or a cocking phase, acceleration, deceleration, and a follow through. Same thing with football. We can see that you've got some uh, wind up or early cocking. Um, it, all of those are really loading that shoulder joint or that up, up uh, that kind of upper extremity lever. Um, and then, depending on what their mechanics are in the the action that they're trying to carry through, you've got your acceleration and follow through. Um, same thing here in tennis, 
you've got your wind up where you have your ball toss um, and then early cocking or a loading phase, late cocking, as you can see, very similar to um, the late cocking phase in uh, pitching where you really have maximal external rotation, loading up that shoulder and elbow joint. And then you've got your acceleration and deceleration phase follow through. Volleyball, volleyball as well. Um, you know that you've got your um, when you talk about your approach, your approach and foot planting. That's sort of your loading. You've got your backswing, and then as they take off, um, you kind of come up, and you can see how the arm has that similar um, motion where you've got uh, abduction, external rotation, and then uh, when you have your um, spike or your swing. And that's where you uh, unload all the force and then the follow through. I had a lot of fun looking up all these different images. It's, it's really neat to look at the breakdown. Um, and swimming is very similar too. And it's, uh, you know, swimming is unique where it's thousands upon thousands of repetitions of that same motion. Um, and so there, you know, instead of an isolated um, cocking or loading phase, they've got uh, kind of your end of pulling. And then you kind of go as you go from early, mid to late recovery, that's kind of where you load up and then um, load up the shoulder joint. And then as they reach and then pull through, that's where they extend a lot of their force through that shoulder girdle. Um, and then you've got your uh, early, mid and late pull through as kind of your acceleration and then deceleration phase. Now that we understand what the upper extremity kind of goes through as they go through all these different motions, we can kind of look, look at the common injuries that the athletes um, will experience. We talk about shoulder impingement, both external and internal. Um, we can talk about uh, labral injuries. Um, there's, there can be some scapular type of injuries, whether it's a six scapula or a snapping scapula. Um, we see quite a lot of thoracic outlet type syndromes in our overhead athletes. And then lastly, we see UCL injuries as well. Talking about impingement, um, as we can see, we're quite familiar. Um, can you see my cursor? Sometimes I don't know if my cursor is, you guys can see what I'm doing or if I'm just showing myself with my cursor. Um, the, uh, as I pointed out, you've got some um, external factors that can certainly lead to um, external impingement. Um, you, know, you can either have uh, an acromion, uh, whether it's anatomically shaped or they're spurring. Um, you can have some calcific tendinosis or tendinitis that, that can be present that leads to some external impingement type of symptoms. Um, and then the acromial types as well, one, two, or three, depending on how hooked or bent they are. Um, most commonly involved is your supraspinous tendon. As you can see where it's situated, it's most at risk for some of that external impingement forces. Um, also present in that area that can cause some pain would be your subacromial bursa. Um, and then typically the athlete um, or the person can experience bursitis versus partial tearing or in extreme cases, full thickness tearing. A lot of treatment looks at correcting mechanics. Um, uh, sometimes you do have to correct some anatomical um, factors if, if these symptoms are recalcitrant. Um, pain control is needed, and we're all familiar with those different modalities, whether it's oral, topical, or injectable type of um, treatments. And then sometimes, rarely, um, we do head out to, uh, to explore surgical type of options if needed. Oops. Um, looking at the... Um, evidence out there. There's uh, not a lot of updated evidence just because we have, are pretty well uh, versed with um, management of uh, operative and non-operative treatments. Typically, we try to exhaust all non-operative type of treatments for external impingement. Um, some of them we had mentioned, and I'm sure that Dr. Wilkes will review some of it as well later on. In refractory cases of partial thickness tearing um, or full, full thickness tearing can lead to surgery. Moving on to internal impingement, um, uh, Dr. Um, Holtz kind of uh, alluded a little bit, you can have an internal impingement mechanism where it's less about the external anatomical factors with the acromion and, and uh, supraspinatus um, getting pinched. But if you've got any sort of 
um, abnormality with your kinetics, whether it's um, incorrect throwing mechanics, uh, whether it's um, ligamentous laxity or uh, micro instability that's already present or um, already present a, a labral tear that leads to instability. You can have um, internal impingement occurring where uh, either um, infraspinatus um, or the labrum starts to get pinched internally and cause pain. Again, abnormal mechanics, ligamentous laxity, um, and micro instability all kind of lead to this type of injury. Um, and a lot of the treatment is um, focused around correcting those biomechanics, see if we can relieve uh, that impingement. Um, the, unless there's some large tear that was already present, typically the internal impingement doesn't need much in terms of surgical intervention. Um, and you know, the most recent data suggests that non-operative management focusing on um, you know, looking at your mechanics, your uh, capsular um, balances is, is, uh, is usually the most successful course of action. Uh, moving on to um, labor injuries. Um, as um, I really liked Dr. Holtz's example of how to describe the labrum. Um, a, lot of, a lot of my time when I see patients is trying to find um, kind of uh, explanations or, or um, examples how we describe the mechanics in the joint to, to our patients who are not familiar with uh, all the different anatomical terms. So you describing the labrum like a washer or a gasket uh, really helps kind of um, helps the patient understand the function of that labrum, uh, where it really provides a seal, uh, an area of stability to the shoulder as it goes through um, whatever motion that they're going through. When we are now starting to deal with tearing of the labrum, um, of course, the tears depend on the location as well as the, the extent of tear. And oftentimes that will dictate what kind of treatments uh, are rendered. Um, we can have traumatic uh, types of labral tearing, which uh, comes from blunt trauma, dislocations, uh, repetitive axial loading or traumatic axial loading, such as a fall. Um, or we have our repetitive um, stress from overhead activities, such as all the throwing motions um, or swimming or serving or tennis, all that stuff that we had talked about just recently. Um, as I had mentioned before, the treatment really varies depending on sort of the size and the location as well as the, as well as what the patient or the athlete or patient is experiencing um, when, when they're in their activity. Um, in addition, what kind of sport um, or activity they're wanting to go back to. If we've got our weekend warrior compared to our F, our collegiate athlete, the management may be a little bit different depending, uh, even if they have the same type of labral tear. The, the two things I tend to um, really hone on to when I see patients with labral injuries is how much pain do they have and how much instability they have, because that will oftentimes dictate how, what kind of uh, op, um, treatment we will recommend. Um, once we talk about labral tears, we start to get into the alphabet soup of uh, shoulder injury and shoulder, um, um, the naming of these tears. We've got our slap tear that we all, most of us are familiar with, our superior um, labral tear anterior to posterior. We've got pasta injuries, Alpsa, Hegel's, Glad's. <laughs> These are all mostly um, important, I think, in you know, for our surgeons in terms of location. Just another way to, I think, describe the different types of uh, labral injuries there are there. But again, from my perspective, when I'm seeing athletes or patients with labral injuries, I really focus on their activity as well as what symptoms they're having. And that really helps us dictate um, what, what kind of treatment they're going to, we're going to recommend. There's some, um, some pretty good studies out there in terms of uh, operative versus non-operative treatment for labral injuries. Um, uh, interestingly enough, if, if uh, really what a lot of, uh, not only what are they experiencing is important, um, in terms of what we uh, recommend, but also what activities they're going back to, because um, you know our, our weekend warrior or our, or our, our occasional um, uh, baseball or, or or softball once a, once a week game type of athlete may not really need as an aggressive treatment versus our collegiate or higher level athletes, which are who are expected to return to a high level of, of overhead type of activity. 
Moving on to the scapula, um, although oftentimes we don't think of the scapula as uh, an area that we can experience a lot of injury, um, scapular motion, as I had alluded to before, uh, in, in humans um, has a lot of, of kind of um, medial to lateral rotation um, involved. We look at the shoulder when, when you are, when the shoulder is moving in abduction, um, the first initial 30 degrees of abduction is the glenohumeral joint itself only. And then as we move uh, from 20 to 90 degrees, then you get um, a ratio of uh, two sort of two degrees of glenohumeral movement to one degree of scapular thoracic movement. Um, so you start to see right in this area, the scapula is starting to do their medial to lateral sort of rotation. Um, and then as we move further up in terms of the abduction arc, um, that, uh, sc uh, the scapula increases a little bit more, um, in their, uh, medial to lateral movement, but abduction is a combination of both just the glenohumeral, um, movement, as well as the, um, scapula thoracic movement. When you've got abnormal mechanics, um, uh, you can get lots of different mechanical symptoms of snapping, clicking, grinding, noise, pain, um, and any sort of abnormal motion, whether it's from uh, scapular dyskinesis, whether uh, from the um, um, cis anterior, your rhomboids, your um, levator scapula, your trapezius, if any of those muscles are not working in sync, you can get a lot of dyskinesis um, in that scapula. Uh, if you have any muscular insufficiency from um, either atrophy from tearing or um, nerve injury, uh, such as long thoracic nerve injury, that can lead to um, abnormal mechanics and scapular dyskinesis, uh, which will also lead, which can lead to a lot of those symptoms as we talked about above. Less commonly, you can have some uh, anatomical um, variations, such as just the, um, the way that the scapula itself is shaped, um, if there is presence of scapular thoracic bursitis or um, uh, less commonly, any kind of neoplasias uh, that are present, they can, osteochondromas, elastofibromas, they can also cause abnormal mechanics as that scapula is moving through um, abduction and scapation motions that will give you some of those symptoms of snapping, clicking, grinding. The treatment in general um, is also focused on improving mechanics, identifying what sort of the, in, the abnormality or the insufficiency is. Um, there are some non-operative or less invasive, invasive treatments you can consider, such as bursal injections if physical therapy or mechanics um, are not helping. And last resort, there are surgical techniques where they do open or arthroscopic treatment for bursectomies or bony debridement, um, as indicated, depending on the cause. <clears throat> Thoracic outlet syndrome, as um, a lot of us are familiar with, uh, is, is a, can comprise of um, affecting several different structures within that thoracic outlet uh, region. Uh, as we know, the thoracic outlet itself is comprised of your uh, clavicle, um, and then you have your, uh, your, your ribs and all the major neurovascular and muscular structures that pass underneath it. Um, the majority of thoracic outlet syndrome um, causes, uh, root causes uh, are neurogenic, but sometimes we do have it, venous or arterial compression that can happen in that thoracic outlet area, depending on what the root cause is. Symptoms will vary, of course, depending on what is being affected. Um, and you can have mixed pictures as well, where you have both neurogenic and um, vascular symptoms. Causes can root from anatomical in nature, whether it's um, an enlarged cervical thoracic, uh, cervical uh, transverse process, or if you have an enlarged, you have a cervical rib that is providing compression in that area as the athletes go through any overhead motions. Um, again, abnormal mechanics, uh, whether it's, um, uh, you know, imbalances or tightness within the scalenes um, or uh, um, increased um, ligamentous laxity or poor shoulder or scapular uh, mechanics can also lead to compression in these areas. Um, again, treatment is largely focused on looking at your mechanics, addressing um, different postures and, and um, stretching out any uh, really tight areas. 
um, that can help relieve some of this compression. If there are some anatomical causes identified, cervical ribs, enlarged scalene muscles or tumors, um, or if there are significant vascular symptoms, surgical intervention is sometimes used. And lastly, we'll come across um, UCL injuries and tears. Again, as we had um, focused on in reviewing the mechanics of um, our baseball pitchers, as well as all the other overhead athletes, all that loading um, in that shoulder uh, typically results in maximal external rotation or some sort of um, point of force in the elbow, um, whether it's uh, you know pitching, tennis serving, volleyball spiking, um, swimming to some degree. Uh, and if the, if your core stability or all your supporting structures are not strong enough to stabilize or, or disperse that force evenly, then you get an overload of, uh, your force along across the UCL resulting into injury. Um, most commonly seen in baseball pitchers, but it can be seen in other sports such as javelin throwers. Um, about 50% of that force is applied across the UCL in those throwing motions. Um, and as we mentioned before, in that late cocking phase where the shoulder is in the maximal external rotation, that's where um, it is most compromised. Treatment also varies from non-operative to operative, sort of depending on the extent um, of presence or the extent of tear and laxity, as well as uh, effect on pain and function. Oops. Ah. Um, you know, looking that there's been lots and lots of literature lately looking at UCL, um, looking at both uh, conservative and um, operative management of uh, UCL injuries. A lot of it, but most of it depends on really the grade of the tear. Um, most partial tears are handled conservatively and non-operatively um, involving lots of relative rest, a um, extensive rehab program plus minus uh, PRP. Um, and then we have our complete tears will typically uh, be managed surgically. There is a wonderful um, article out there, uh, put out there by our own Dr. Zaremski that has an excellent algorithm that really helps us look and um, kind of manage our UCL injuries. And as we say, we can um, do a lot of non-operative management for sprains and partial low or high grade uh, tears. Um, and then it also takes into consideration where they are in their um, activity and what level of acti activity they are when it comes to their uh, throwing um, career. And then um, of course, with our complete ruptures, we'll typically refer to our orthopedic colleagues. And so I know we're doing questions that are in, but um, you know, lots of, uh, we've got, uh, that was my review of, um, common injuries in overhead athletes. Uh, fortunately, neither of these athletes got injured in this picture. Um, and I think we're ready to move on to the next talk. Thanks, Dr. Lou, appreciate it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go next. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. All right, so we're gonna discuss here upper extremity peripheral nerve injuries in throwing athletes. And so I will uh, you know, do my best to try to wrap up a little bit early and, um, and hopefully you know, pull us back on time a bit. We're about, you know, we're not, not too bad right now. So upper extremity peripheral nerve injuries in throwing athletes. This is just a plug for our baseball medicine program here at Emory. You can go to our website down here at the bottom. We have some resources on the website uh, if anyone's interested. So this is going to be largely based on um, our paper. So myself, Chris Cherian, and, and Jason Zaremski. This just was first published online on a couple days ago, two days ago. So our review on upper extremity peripheral nerve injuries and throwing athletes and so most of this talk is gonna come from here. So please access this paper. This data wasn't, you know, especially as it pertains to throwing athletes, this data was not in one place in the literature. And so hopefully by, by kind of pulling it from everywhere and putting it into one document, it can be helpful, especially for those that are interested in athletes. 
So our agenda for as far as what I will talk about. So we're going to look at some background general considerations and the peripheral nerve injuries that I am going to discuss tonight are going to be ulnar neuropathy, suprascapular neuropathy, quadrilateral space syndrome, and or which also includes axillary neuropathy and neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome that Dr. Liu had touched on a bit. Other relevant peripheral nerve injuries and throwers that I'm not going to discuss just for the sake of time, it would take too long to go through all of them, are going to be median neuropathy, which is much less common. It, you know, When we think of median neuropathy, such as carpal tunnel syndrome, that's going to be, while we see it all the time in patients, in a thrower specifically, it's going to be much less common. Radial or posterior neurosis neuropathy, long thoracic neuropathy, and musculotaneous neuropathy. So these, uh, all of these are addressed in our review paper, but I'm not going to go into them tonight. So throwing mechanics and injury. So as Dr. Holtz had, had shown, the throwing motion just in and of itself possesses an inherent risk of injury just due to you know, the amount of force that's moving through the throwing arm. And because of coexisting pathology and that risk of injury, the diagnosis of throwing related peripheral nerve injuries is often delayed. Also it's delayed because in throwers, these peripheral nerve, nerve injuries are often dynamic in that they're just occurring through the throwing motion. They're not necessarily getting symptoms all the time at rest. And so static tests such as EMGs and MRIs, it's hard to identify these things because they are dynamic and, and happening. Uh, in a dynamic fashion. And so there is some literature uh, out there. Uh, one of my colleagues with the Braves, Dr. Gary Laurie, has published on this doing pre and post exercise MRIs to look at how things change with dynamic activity. Uh, and I think that is, is helpful. And then also certainly what we can do with ultrasound where we can do some dynamic imaging can be helpful here as well. So alteration in the kinetic chain due to a peripheral nerve injury increases the risk for further injury. So if we don't identify a peripheral nerve injury, this pitcher's having pain, the kinetic chain breaks down, it's gonna increase the risk for further injury. And so clinicians have to be cognizant of peripheral upper extremity, peripheral nerve injury locations that happen more frequently in throwers than in the general population. And so from a data standpoint, there is one paper in high school level athletes showing that 9.4% of peripheral nerve injuries are season ending in, in, at the high school level. So this, I'm not going to belabor the biomechanics points as Dr. Holtz had, had already done her talk. And so we're just looking at a throwing motion here. And the only, only thing I want to highlight is as we go through this is that, well, is just the amount of force that's going through this throwing arm and the amount of valgus stress that's moving through that the, um, the elbow and the amount of rotational force on the shoulder is just tremendous. And so we just see here why these throwing arms are so, uh, uh, are, are so, uh, are such a high risk for injury. So from a history standpoint and for these peripheral nerve injuries, presenting symptoms, as most of us know, are gonna be pain, numbness, paresthesia, weeks. However, in throwers, the, the presenting complaint may be dead arm or functional decline. They may not complain of numbness. They just say their arm feels dead. They don't throw, they can't throw at the same velocity. They don't have the same location as they had before. Um, and, and that could be the presenting symptom. So if they come in with a dead arm, you think of things like posterior impingement or labral tears, but also, also think of peripheral nerve injuries. Um, Pay close attention to aggravating factors and arm positions, and that is, you know, when in the throwing cycle do the symptoms occur? As we'll see through this talk, a lot of these symptoms that we'll talk, or the, the ones specifically we'll talk about today will be in that kind of late cocking, early acceleration phase where the arm is in abduction and kind of extreme external rotation. At this point, I'm going to defer a general discussion on physical exam and a general discussion on diagnostic workup. We'll get into those things a bit more as we get into the specifics of some of these. But general treatment considerations. So often I know some of, a lot of us, some, uh, you know, a kid has pain and we'll talk about giving them NSAIDs to see if of course the NSAIDs calms it down. But a recent Cochrane review shows that for nerve symptoms, NSAIDs actually have really poor data to support their use. And so many need to think twice about using NSAIDs when, when it comes to peripheral nerve injuries. Neuropathic agents, you know, we talked about gabapentin, things like that. The efficacy, but the side effects, especially in a high-level athlete, are 
you know, are going to outweigh the benefits. And so somnolence and dizziness and those things, just agents we probably don't want to use in a high level athlete. So we're going to focus on targeted rehabilitation programs, which Dr. Wilk will, will talk about later. And then certainly um, I'm biased when it comes to ultrasound, seeing as that's kind of the primary thing that I use in my clinic, both from a diagnostic and a therapeutic standpoint. But ultrasound guided injections have huge diagnostic and therapeutic utility for, for peripheral nerve injuries. It does require ultrasound and injection technical expertise. From um, And so what you do with these injections is a hybrid dissection where you're doing a kind of a perineural injection around the nerve and dissecting it out with fluid. And you can use a combination of local anesthetic and saline, local anesthetic, saline, corticosteroid, or dextrose prolotherapy. There is data showing that local anesthetic plus corticosteroid does better than local anesthetic alone. Uh, but if we also look at this, this trial down here, there's level one data in carpal tunnel syndrome showing that dextrose prolotherapy is superior to hydrodissection with saline or corticosteroid alone. So dextrose prolotherapy uh, is probably something we need more data on, but certainly is something that's cheap and easy to do that, that we can do a, an ultrasound guided dissection around some of these nerves and good, good relief from. And I've, you know, clinically and, and personally had good relief with dextrose prolotherapy with a series of hydrodissections for different, um, different peripheral nerve uh, injuries and compression syndromes. And then certainly surgery. So this table is in our paper. It, it's just a, a good summary that you can refer to just common signs and symptoms, etiology and diagnosis of these different uh, peripheral nerve injuries that will happen in throwing athletes. And so it'll include the ones I'll talk about uh, tonight, as well as some of the other ones that I'm not going to talk about. So this table is in our papers, if anyone wants to refer to it for a quick reference. So we'll begin talking about the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve is the most common peripheral uh, mononeuropathy in, um, in throwing athletes. And it's gonna be due to traction and compressive force at the elbow during that late cocking and early acceleration phase, like I mentioned before. And so you know, put traction and compression on that ulnar nerve through those phases of the throwing motion. And it's these excessive and repetitive valgus forces which put uh, stress and, and compression forces on the nerve that are going to cause injury. And with throwing, data shows that pressure in the cubital tunnel with throwing increases, they were six to 20 times greater than a baseline. So, so huge amount um, of pressure through that cubital tunnel with the throwing motion. So the initial presenting symptoms may be, as I mentioned before, maybe diminished performance rather than your typical nerve symptoms. You may have medial elbow pain with or without sensory changes. They initially, it could be just dynamic where they only throw, occur with bone motion in that late cocking and early acceleration phase. And then as things progress, the, uh, the athlete may begin to have symptoms at rest. One of the th thing to think about, is does the athlete have subluxation of the nerve? Is it snapping and popping over that medial epicondyle as you go from extension into flexion? And you can tell this very easily with dynamic ultrasound where we can see if there's subluxation there. Sometimes you can also just palpate it. And the thing you wanna think about with subluxation is does it reproduce the symptoms? Because data has shown that there's asymptomatic subluxation in about 16% of individuals. And Kawabata in, in this paper looked at dynamic ultrasounds of a bunch of youth baseball players, and a third of them had asymptomatic ulnar nerve displacement on those dynamic ultrasounds. And so just because they have subluxation doesn't necessarily mean that that's the cause of their symptoms. But if they have subluxation that reproduces the symptoms, that's probably a big component of it. And then the diagnosis is often complicated by other elbow pathology. And so 42% of throwing athletes with UCL injuries also have ulnar neuritis and 53% of, of throwers with medial epicondylopathy also have ulnar neuritis. So it'll often happen in conjunction with other elbow pathology, which sometimes will delay the diagnosis of the ulnar neuritis component of their elbow pain. Diagnostic tests that we can use 
certainly ultrasound is what I use the most just because of, of it's the, what I have in clinic and what I'm trained to use. Uh, I do that for nerve cross-sectional area measurements. So the larger the cross-sectional area, they can get into the abnormal range and it can show some nerve irritation and compression. And then also we can look for dynamic subluxation I mentioned before. MRI is not used to evaluate the nerve. Uh, specifically, it's used to evaluate for other pathology. And then EMG nerve conduction studies, it, they may be normal uh, until it reaches the advanced stages. So a normal EMG certainly does not rule out ulnar neuropathy or ulnar neuritis. So just because you have a patient, they seem to have ulnar nerve symptoms and they get an EMG and it comes back normal, that doesn't mean they don't have ulnar nerve pathology. They may just have symptomatic subluxation that occurs through the throwing motion and that's what's causing the neuritis. So this is just an ultrasound picture. We kind of lay the, the patient's back and we ultrasound at the medial epicondyle, which we see here. We'll see the ulnar nerve here and then we can trace around the ulnar nerve and get some cross-sectional area measurements. And this that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk is talking about the specific cross-sectional area measurements, but there, there are plenty of good papers in the literature talking about kind of the, the normal and abnormal ranges for nerve cross-sectional area. And it's just an easy way to to diagnose nerve pathology where you don't necessarily need an EMG or nerve conduction study. And here we're just looking at the ulnar nerve as we come a little bit distal down through the cubital tongue, we see the FCU, uh, the two heads of the FCU and the ulnar nerve coming down between them and we can measure the ulnar nerve there as well. Uh, the next one is just a picture of ulnar nerve, uh, video of ulnar nerve subluxation. Don't judge this ultrasound image. It's not very good. Uh, the depth is all wonky on it, but it's just for the purpose of showing the nerve sliding out. So this is arm moving from extension and deflection. And we'll see the ulnar nerve here kind of popping and perching on top of the medial epicondyle and coming back. And so we can easily see that on ultrasound and determine whether or not that reproduces symptoms. So for management, um, non-operative three to six months uh, before surgery is considered, we're gonna rest from throwing. Uh, so we'll have some physical therapy, may consider doing an ultrasound guided injection and nighttime splinting. They're not gonna start throwing a program again until they're asymptomatic. And the caveat here is if they have symptomatic subluxation. If they have symptomatic subluxation, then you may be quicker to refer them for surgery to go ahead and have the transposition. So, and then for surgery specifically, with a um, failure of non-operative management, persistent symptomatic instability, if they have concomitant elbow pathology or, or severe symptoms, you may go to surgery uh, faster with those. And in looking through the data and in talking to different sport surgeons and upper extremity surgeons, the preferred surgical technique in throwers is gonna be decompression with a subcutaneous transposition. If you do decompression alone without the transposition, it doesn't address the subluxation and also, and in a patient that doesn't already have subluxation, it can predispose them to having that nerve instability. And in a thrower, a submuscular transposition can cause damage to the flexor pronator mass, which you don't, uh, which you don't want. You can also have some continued uh, post-op symptoms with submuscular transposition. Uh, so second here, we'll talk about um, suprascapular neuropathy. And so the suprascapular nerve we know innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus um, with, a, with, um, with compression at the suprascapular notch, there could be a deep, dull kind of posterior shoulder pain. Um, and then be some, there may be some weakness, but usually at the suprascapular notch, it's more of uh, pain and you can have atrophy of the supraspinatus. With compression at the spinoglenoid notch, you may have more just weakness and atrophy and it's often painless. So as I mentioned, kind of a vague, deep posterior shoulder pain, and that pain is gonna be worsened in the cocking phase of throwing. Uh, there may be some weakness and there may be some atrophy that's gonna be more at the spinoglenoid notch, but as you see here, throwing athletes are more susceptible to injuries at the spinoglenoid notch uh, with isolated atrophy and weakness. And so, uh, some one study looked at the amount of MLB pitchers with isolated and precipitous atrophy, and there's that was about four percent of ML, MLB pitchers had that isolated atrophy, and those were more prevalent in higher volume pitchers. 
there's often a component of scapular dyskinesia with suprascapular neuropathy. So with repetitive overhead activity with a component of scapular dyskinesia, you're going to cause repetitive stretch and compression of the nerve. And so for suprascapular neuropathy, the causes are either going to be that repetitive traction with a component of scapular dyskinesia with overhead throwing, uh, or you're going to have a structural compression from a paralabral cyst. So say a thrower has a slap tear, they develop a paralabral cyst, and that can cause compression of either suprascapular notch or the spinal glenoid notch. From a diagnosis standpoint, we can use EMGs. They're frequently normal, as are MRI and ultrasound. MRI and ultrasound are useful in that they can show you a, a cyst that could be compressing the nerve, but not super useful other than that. And then what I use and, and kind of what we use in Emory as part of our diagnosis for suprascapular neuropathy is we use diagnostic sound guided nerve blocks. And it's a very useful way to quickly confirm the diagnosis. And so this is what your uh, diagnostic block or even a therapeutic uh, suprascapular notch injection is going to look like. You have your trap here, your supraspinatus, and you're going to see your suprascapular notch here with the uh, uh, suprascapular nerve bling right down here in the notch. And then your injections kind of look just like this. Actually, once you get used to doing them, they're very quick and easy to do. As far as management, again, rest and rehab, which we're gonna see across the board for all of these, peeling back from throwing, beginning a good rehab program for the suprascapular nerve specifically, because there often is a, a scapular dyskinesis com, uh, component. We're gonna have, uh, we're gonna look at scapulothoracic and scapular humeral motion. Um, deltoid and rotator cuff strengthening can make it worse. So that's just some, something to keep in mind. Consider an ultrasound guided therapeutic injection. If they don't get better with uh, rest and rehab, nerve decompression or the release of the transverse scapular ligament, you can remove the compressive lesion. And the biggest thing is that rehab is so important, whether surgery is pursued or not. If we don't address the biomechanics and functional movement, uh, these symptoms are going to come right back. Next is quadrilateral space syndrome, or uh, which includes the axillary nerve. So the anatomy that we'll see here, and if anyone can see my picture, I'll pop it back up. And frequently what we'll do is, is this, where we have the medial head of the triceps here, the humerus here, the teres minor up top and the teres major down below. And that space in between my fingers is your uh, quadrilateral space. And that's an easy way to think of it. And in that quadrilateral space, you'll see the axillary nerve and the posterior humeral circumflex artery. And so what puts you at higher risk for quadrilateral space syndrome? Because in the general population, it's not something that, that you're going to see a ton of. Um, but what puts you at higher risk is repetitive use of the shoulder in abduction and external rotation. So that, again, that late cocking, early acceleration phase is going to put you at higher risk for this. And so certainly pitchers and that quadrilateral space is going to close down due to contraction of the teres major um, in the teres minor. And it's going to be most common in individuals under 40 who do repetitive overhead activity. So this is something that's much more common in throwers and we're going to see in the general population. So these individuals are going to come in a lot of times. They're not going to have a ton of weakness. They're not going to have numbness. It's going to be more that fatigue and dead arm syndrome. They're going to have posterior shoulder pain that's kind of dull and vague with some radiation into the axilla. Uh, you'll have some tenderness to palpation over the quadrilateral space. And then if you put them at, at abduct to 90 degrees and resist external rotation, then you can get some re reproduction of pain there. The best diagnostic tool is going to be a diagnostic ultrasound guided injection. Um, EMG and nerve conduction uh, studies are often normal as, again, these symptoms are often dynamic and positional. And MRI can be helpful if there's a cyst or a mass or see some denervation changes in the muscle. But, but usually the way that we diagnose it here when we see it is a diagnostic ultrasound guided injection. And so that's what we're looking at right here. We'll see the picture. Here's the deltoid. The teres major is here, the quadrilateral space that's right in here where the nerve and artery sit, and your needle is going to come down right here, and you'll, you'll see how we're doing it. I wasn't actually injecting this person with, without gloves on. That's more for demonstration. Um, and so that's what it's going to look like from an injection standpoint, and we'll do that diagnostic injection there, and then we'll put them through some motions and see if we can reproduce their pain um, or if their pain is better. 
management here. So if anyone's interested in ultrasound guided um, diagnosis and management for quadrilateral space syndrome, here's a good paper right here that um, you can look into and it, it'll have some ultrasound images and some techniques on, on how to do that if you're interested. Um, so rest and rehab, again, I won't belabor that. I'll leave that to, um, to Dr. Wilk to discuss these things. Ultrasound guided injection for pain relief. And then again, in three to six months, if they fail not up management, uh, then you can have a decompression of the quadrilateral space. There isn't a ton of data in the literature on surgical techniques for this, but for the data that is out there, there are very few complications that are reported. And so lastly, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time with this. So I'll, I'll try to wrap it up um, since uh, uh, Dr. Liu went through this some um, neurogenic thoracic outlet. It's like my favorite thing now. It's, it's one of my biggest clinical interests. Um, we actually end up treating a lot of it here at Emory just because of some of the surgeons that we have. And so I've been lucky enough to get involved with a lot of these patients on the ultrasound side. So it's compression and irritation of the brachial plexus, which what we find here, it's much more common at the rectorial petrolis minor space than at the interscalene triangle. Throwing athletes are, have a three times higher prevalence of thoracic outlet syndrome compared to the general population. Baseball and softball are gonna be your most commonly associated with it based on NCAA data. And then secondarily, you'll see water polo and swimming are gonna be you know, next on that list based on this NCAA data. And again, worse with repetitive overhead activities. Again, you'll see late cocking, early acceleration phases with that shoulder and abduction and significant external rotation of the arm. You're going to narrow down the specifically the retropectoralis minor space. So those cords, the medial lateral and, and posterior cords are going to be compressed up against the pec minor with that arm in that position. And then certainly with throwing athletes with that throwing arm arc of motion that shifted towards external rotation, that's going to predispose them to neurogenic thoracic outlet as well. Um, working on a review paper with one of my colleagues at Mayo Clinic in Florida, one of the um, talented medical illustrators at Mayo Clinic put this together for us. And this is just looking at the compression so you can kind of visualize the compression back behind the pectoralis minor. So we see the pectoralis minor coming to the coracoid here, and we see how putting that arm into abduction and external rotation can, can compress those structures underneath the pectoralis minor. Again, presentation is going to be non-specific. You may have some anterior shoulder tightness, maybe some paresthesias and radiating arm, um, shoulder and arm pain. On exam, you'll see some scapular dyskinesia. They, if they have a, a scaling component, there'll be some tenderness at the interscaling triangle. There may be some tenderness um, at the coracoid. Um, it's, you can do a tenels at the coracoid or, or just medial to the coracoid. The suprascapular stretch test that you're going to see right here that Dr. LaFosse has demonstrated in the literature. So you can do that suprascapular stretch test. And then frequently, some of these patients will have, you know, when they have spasm of that pectoralis minor, their affected shoulder will be rolled off the table like this, as you can see there. So have them lay down and, and look to see if one shoulder is kind of pulled up off the table compared to the other. But, you know, like, um, uh, like in a lot of other places, these special tests have a lot of false positives. Diagnosis, we can use ultrasound, brachial plexus MRI, EMG is often normal, diagnostic injections in the suprascapular nerve and pec minor. This paper is beyond the scope of this talk, but there's a great, um, great paper from Suture from uh, earlier in the 2010s for diagnosis of retropectoralis minor. Uh, neurogenic thoracic outlet with ultrasound. And so look into that if you have a specific ultrasound interest. Um, we see here some of my ultrasound images where we see the pectoralis minor coming across right here under the coracoid. And we see those neurovascular structures that are laying right behind the pectoralis minor. So as we see here, we're moving the arm from adduction into abduction. And you see in this, in this adduction, uh, a relaxed uh, pectoralis minor with those structures beneath. And when you move that arm into abduction, you see those neurovascular structures just kind of come up and compress underneath the pectoralis minor. So, um, and we just see, we see that bowing of the pectoralis minor and that's a way that you can get a sense of if they're, they're, um, they have some pectoralis minor space compression. 
here's a diagnostic injection that we'll do. So you see where my probe is going to lie and will come just medial to the coracoid. Here's my needle coming in here. Your pec minor is coming across right here and you'll see the needle. We go into the pec minor and then just below it kind of right on top of those neurovascular structures. If there's a scalene component, um, you'll see the probe up at the neck of the scalenes. We see the scalene anatomy here with the anterior scalene, middle scalene, and the brachial plexus coming through here. And then this is just a quick video that shows my needle coming into the middle scalene right here. Um, not as a quick video, but you'll see kind of the needle coming in and see those, you know, nice uh, vascular structures kind of pumping right there. And from a treatment standpoint, certainly again, rest and rehab. Um, we can do different injections, but a lot of the injections that we have don't have great data to, to support them. And so kind of what we do here, we don't rely on injections to give us long-term relief. We use them more on the diagnostic side. We have Botox, some of these pec binders and scalenes, and they, you know, they just provide like three months to relief and then the symptoms will come back. And so um, we haven't found any injections here that give significant long-term relief and there are no data in the literature uh, on CSI or biologics. Um, and then again, surgery is going to decompress the thoracic outlet and be some combination of pectoralis minor release, brachial plexus neurolysis, scalenectomy, and first rib resection. Um, from a purely scalene or rectopectoralis minor space, um, neurogenic thoracic outlet, you can frequently skip the rib resection and patients do pretty well. Um, with the others that are, has much less comorbidity to it. And then this paper from Gutman in 2021 with 27 MLB pitchers after thoracic outlet surgery, 74% uh, percent of them returned to the MLB at an average of 297 days post-op. And most of their performance metrics, including velocity, were mostly unchanged. So again, I went longer than I should have, and I apologize for that, but the ones we didn't discuss today were um, here, radial nerve, long thoracic nerve, and I'll leave them out for the sake of time. So questions we'll get to at the end. And sorry for going long. All right. Dr. Sharemsky, you're next. All righty. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bowers. Um, let's see here. Uh, can you see that? I could. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, a real pleasure to be able to speak with everyone tonight, um, you know, colleagues and experts and mentors. So what my talk is going to focus on, you know, you've got, we've gone from the biomechanics to the common injuries to some more, more the nerve side of things. And after me, Dr. Wilkes will uh, finish up with the rehabilitative side of things. Well, what I want to take a step back and think about the prevention prediction of these injuries, particularly the overuse injuries and workload in the overhead athletes. So most of this talk may not be in your CAQ exam, but will certainly be something you need to be aware of if you're going to take care of athletes, particular overhead athletes. Um, I have no disclosures. So, you know, a lot of times what, what we're going to do and what I recommend to our trainees is, you know, how are you going to talk to coaches and athletes and, and parents and what do you want? You know, as a parent or as a coach, we might want our son or daughter to throw harder or faster. We want our athletes or kids to be successful. We certainly want to improve performance, but on the flip side, we also want them to make sure they stay healthy. And sometimes the first three are in direct uh, concert against, you know, number four. So it's sort of a balancing act. And, you know, I think uh, Dr. Bowers probably alluded to it a little bit, but, you know, the growth of research in throwing athletes has been exponential in about the last decade, decade and a half or so. This is a, uh, some images I took from December, and this is just using, you know, terms baseball and injury, softball and injury, and injury prevention throwing separately. And you can see just the significant growth of evidence-based research and publication in that time. Um, you know, in one burgeoning area of research um, that I really feel like especially AMSM members should have an ability to really tackle is kind of the overuse aspect of things and the workload aspect of things. Um, from an overuse standpoint, I will talk about pitch counts a little bit, 
but then also workload, which is a concept that if you are aware of or you've started to learn, especially the fellows and residents that are online tonight, um, that's something that's been more talked about in greater detail in the lower extremities and just starting to get looked at in the upper extremities. So what are some non-surgical areas, particularly in research, that we can really get involved in and make a difference in? Well, the first is usage or volume, however you want to describe it. And traditionally, innings was how someone would talk about it. You know, Greg Max threw 250 innings this season, or Nolan Ryan threw 300 innings this season. Well, these days, and really in the last five or 10 years, there's been a significant push when you're uh, really trying to describe volume in pitchers. Uh, not from innings, but with pitch counts, because that's the true measure of how much you're actually doing something, in this case, pitching a ball. And the second area is workload, which I'll go into depth a little bit as well. So, you know, the, the first question I always ask the folks is, outside of the fact that maybe like baseball or softball or sports, is why do you actually care about this? Well, if you want to be a good sports medicine physician, if you want to be a good sports medicine team member, you have to understand that if you're taking care of throwing athletes, throwing injuries are ridiculously common. There was a really nice systematic review published in AJSM a couple of years ago. And uh, what uh, Dr. Norton and his colleagues did was really break down factors into known risk factors, thought to be risk factors significantly, and not really. And if you look at the known risk factors, and I highlighted in the left-hand side in yellow is arm fatigue, and then pitches per game for shoulder injuries, not necessarily elbow injuries. And if you look at the other factors, some things that we think might happen, but we're not confirmed, things such as shoulder, external range of motion, total arc of motion, which uh, you know, Dr. Wilk is a real expert in. Um, we think that it, is, it can be a significant risk factor, but we, we can't really say. And they talk about innings pitch per game, but that's now been pushed towards uh, pitches per game or pitch counts. So you really have to understand when you're talking about different risk factors, what the evidence actually shows. The other thing to understand, and, and you know, I, I show this cartoon a lot, this came from our colleagues in Australia and Scandinavia, or the Scandinavian countries is, why do we get injured? And this is a, a really good concept for anyone in healthcare to understand if you're in musculoskeletal medicine. You have these intrinsic risk factors, whether it be how old you are, how flexible you are, Previous injury, maybe there's some genetic component, that predisposes an athlete to something. Then this predisposed athlete gets exposed to these extrinsic risk factors. It may be pitching in cold weather. It may be wearing brand new shoes. Maybe the ground is hard and you're pitching in Massachusetts as opposed to Florida or California in March. And then that can make you susceptible to the inside event. Inside event, in this case, is going to be throwing a ball or pitching a ball, and then you become injured. These algorithms have gotten more detailed as the years have gone on. Here's one that's gone a little bit more detailed. It starts to add in the neuromuscular aspects of things as well. Exposure to extrinsic risk factors has a few more details. And then the susceptibility is, are you injured or not injured? And if you're injured, do you recover or you don't recover? Well, as a result of that, a couple of our colleagues here at UF and myself, we want to develop a model for injury causality in adolescent throwing athletes. And really, we weren't really reinventing the wheel. Honestly, I think anyone on this call, if they put their mind to it, could develop different models of injury causality for different sports. But what we did is, particularly right here in the lower left-hand side, we really want to focus on those developmental risk factors, your strength, your range of motion, particularly with your shoulder. Um, what is your skill level? Are you someone who's thrown 55 miles per hour and you're 15 years old? Or are you one of those kids that's six foot two starting to shave and you're throwing 87 miles per hour? Those are very different kids, even though they're both 15 years old. What about a history of prior throwing injuries? Are you physically ready to participate in sport? All of these come into play to predispose an athlete, um, particularly a throwing athlete, to injury. Then you add in the exposure to extrinsic risk factors, which we go into more detail. And one thing we want to highlight here is sports specialization. This is something that has become really a hotbed topic. And actually, one of Dr. Bauer's colleagues, Dr. Jomthi, is probably the leader or one of the leaders in, in addition with Dr. David Bell, who's a physical therapist at the University of Wisconsin on sports specialization in adolescent athletes. We also know that there's really poor measures of workload and throwing dominant sports. Um, this is really the first and best systematic review on monitoring workload in throwing dominant sports. 
And essentially what it says is there's really poor measurements, poor tools at this time to measure this. What we need to have are, are consistent tools to measure volume, which we're starting to be good at with pitch counts, something that measures intensity or effort and velocity, because we know there's a lot more stress on the arm and the body when you throw 95 miles per hour as opposed to 75 miles per hour. But then you also got to take in the context, the kinetic chain biomechanics, someone that has a poorly or a weak gluteus medius and poor balance is going to be very different than the athlete who has great biomechanics and a very strong gluteus medius. So what's one possible explanation for these increasing injuries if we have all this data and all this research that's been coming out in the last 10 to 20 years? Um, this is a picture from our uh, human dynamics lab at UF um, with one of our pitchers. And basically we know that the, you know, these baseball players are accumulating unaccounted pitching volume during warm-up and bullpen, but we didn't really count for this before. Um, you know, like I talked about before, we're going from innings to pitch counts, but we're not really measuring the true volume of something. And if we're going to start someplace to determine what a workload is, what a volume is, you actually have to count everything that you do. So the reason this comes into play is as of July of 2016, the United States, the National Federation of State High School Association approved a new pitching policy. It basically is that every state, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, would need to have a pitch restriction policy based on the number of pitches thrown per game, not innings. Um, essentially what each state for the most part did, a few start states went a little bit off of this, is they use what's called Major League Baseball's Pitch Smart Guidelines. And for those of you who aren't aware, this is a great website. Uh, I put the link in the lower left-hand side. So the leaders uh, at MLB from the sports medicine, sports performance side, and also with some uh, affiliation with Little League Baseball and USA Baseball, what they did is they devised the recommendation based on age and daily max pitches in live game situation. And based on those amount of pitches, you then are recommended, or depending on your state law, you have to rest from pitching for X amount of days. So let's say you're a high school senior, you're 18 years old, you throw 102 pitches, and it's Monday. Well, if you threw 102 pitches, you are now going to need four days of rest, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the earliest you can pitch in a game, even to come in for one pitch, if this is what your state adopted, would not be until Saturday. And obviously, it's not anything you have to memorize, but it's a great resource for parents uh, and student athletes. Most coaches are aware of this, I would say, at this point, but it's good to just kind of have you bookmark it on your computer or your phone. So what we wanted to find out at UF is how many pitches do pitchers actually throw? Um, we know they throw more than what they do in the live game, but we actually need to know a true volume before we can find out a fatigability state. So what we did to kind of highlight some of, some of the work that our team did is we counted pitches off of varsity high school baseball mounds at 34 different high schools in North Central Florida um, in 2017. And what we did is we defined the total game day pitches as your bullpen plus your warm-up plus, plus your live game pitches. So it wasn't anything fancy, but what we did was, you know, after about 14,000 pitches uh, were recorded that high school season, uh, we had 115 high school, uh, varsity high school starting pitcher outings. And what we found was this. When you look at the live game pitches in the left-hand side, the average number of game pitches was about 70, which is, which is great. I think coaches were doing a fantastic job, at least in our region. And if you look at the range, the range is from 18. I think that person actually got shelled or was knocked out in the first inning to 103. Well, if you remember, the maximum number of recommended live pitches is 105 if you're 18 years old. So our coaches did great in this region. However, when you start to add in the bullpen, the warm-up pitches, the average number of pitches thrown was not 69 pitches. It was actually 120 pitches. And just for comparison's sake, and this kind of emphasizes why total innings pitched is not a great marker of volume, that was based on only four innings. The other thing is, if you actually look at the total range, our range went from just under 50 to over 170 pitches, and that uh, we had over 12% of our kids throw more than 150 pitches. None of them threw more than seven innings. So that, that's kind of impressive when you start thinking about the numbers, and this might be one thing, one reason to think about why there's this cumulative chronic workload effect working in our younger pitchers. 
What's the limitations? Um, I think anyone would tell you, look, this is an observational study, made absolutely no attempt to correlate toll pitches with the onset of injury. We didn't take into account throwing effort, velocity, or intensity. Um, we didn't talk about non-game day throwing or non-warm-ups uh, on off days, I mean. And, I, and also, there's variability in how folks want to do things. Our job in this case was not to regulate a bullpen, was not to change pitching mechanics. We essentially were flying the wall. Whether you want to pitch like Johnny Cueto does or you have any other pitching motion, um, you know, our job, honestly, in this study was to get the true volume of pitches, period, end of story, and then move on. So, you know, there's a substantial amount of pitching volume that's really not accounted for in the high school players um, due to the warm up and bullpen activity, as you would expect. And really, close monitoring of these extra pitches should it occur to help mitigate overuse injury risk. I'm not saying to throw less in the bullpen or do less warm up pitches. I think coaches, athletic trainers, sports performance team members need to be aware of this because the significance is this is really the first study that actually determined the true volume of pitches thrown off a mound on a game day. And by understanding the true volume of these pitches, we can now move, for, uh, move forward and develop further systems to monitor workloads over longer periods of time. So this was actually a springboard for further research. So now we need to determine a workload. So for all, most of the fellows on, I would think, you know, you're about seven months into your fellowship. You would have seen this picture by now. If you haven't, this is a, it, I don't want to say classic because it's not that old, but this is one of the more well-known uh, cartoons put out there. This is led by Dr. Tim Gabbett, who is probably the international world-renowned leader in what workload is and my publications he puts out. He's in Australia. Anything by Gabbett's usually very good. And this is basically a snapshot of an athlete's work with respect to sport or exercise. So when you talk about acute workload, that is the fatigue state of an athlete. So that's where you look at it from one to seven days versus a chronic workload is the fitness readiness of an athlete. So here's a great example. And I usually use running as an example because it's a lot easier to think about. If you run three miles every other day for a week, you're running three to three. So that's a work acute, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, three, three, three. So that's nine for the week. And if you do that for four weeks straight, you run three miles, three miles, three miles, and you do it every time, your ratio is going to be one because you're not changing it at all. Now, let's say you go from running three miles on a Monday and three miles on a Wednesday and Saturday say, you know what? I don't have to go to work. I'm not in clinic. I'm not on call. I'm going to go run 10 miles. You just more than tripled your workload. So your acute workload went up three, actually 3.3 to one, because you normally run three miles, now you're running 10. So you've left the, the ideal zone, which is around a one to 1 1.3, 0.9 to 1.3, and you just went all the way up out of the graph. And what data has suggested, more so in the lower extremities, is once you get beyond a one to 1 1.3, your risk of injury begins to go up. Doesn't mean you're getting injured, but just your risk goes up. So now we, you know, we, we've gone over the basic concept of workload. Let's go back to the question, why is there, where is there a lack of decrease in pitching injuries? We, we have all these pitch count regulations now, it's been going on for five years, um, but there's many other factors why. The other thing is, you know, a note on some maximum throwing, this is, is something, a, a critique I should say that many people say is, well, you're not throwing very hard in the bullpen. You're not really throwing all that hard when you warm up. And I agree with you. You are 100% correct. Warm-ups are absolutely less likely to be thrown uh, at a maximum level. It's with submax throwing. But data has suggested that factors with the greatest association for chronic pitching injury were overuse and fatigue. This is probably uh, one of the papers I quote the most. Uh, Sam Olson uh, wrote this when he was a fellow at the um, American Sports Medicine Institute under the supervision of Tracy Ray, one of our former presidents at AMSSM. And Glenn Fleissig, I believe, was the senior author on this. And this looked at adolescent athletes. So whether you are th throwing with max effort or submax effort, there is some accumulation of overuse and fatigue that you need to be aware of. So by knowing the exact number of pitches thrown on a game day, this is required to then determine what your fatigue levels are in order to build up 
a chronic workload to prevent chronic injury. But what's missing? What haven't we talked about yet? We haven't really talked about combining the intensity or velocity with the volume to improve our measures of workload in throwers. This is a really nice review of workload monitoring um, that just came out from Brittany Dowling and her team. Uh, I think it was last year or about a year and a half ago. So they took one of these algorithms that I showed you before, but they added in the workload component. So it was really nice when you add in the volume of throws intensity and talk about the imbalance and that can lead to a fatigable state that can lead to tissue micro trauma. And if this damage gets accumulated without repair, again, we go from a predisposed to a susceptible athlete and then you expose them to the event, which is in this case throwing, and that's when injury occurs. I also want to throw this in. This literally just came out. I saw it about three hours ago on Twitter. I know what Dr. Bowers and Dr. Holt were talking about before. This literally just came out. So this is a chronic workload study led by Samir Mehta, who's a doctoral physical therapist. I think he's in Orlando now. And what they did is they looked at 49 male baseball players. Uh, most of them were around high school seniors or so. And they looked over a four-year period and give them tremendous amount of credit. Using a, a, a device called the Modus Throw Sleeve, um, they record nearly 900,000 throws and over 9,400 athlete exposures were captured. Now, the reason that research is so difficult with baseball, particularly when you're not in the uh, professional level, is only 24 injuries were recorded and only 11 of them were throwing related. So think about that. Almost 900,000 throws, only 11 <clears throat> throwing injuries. So it's a labor of love what a lot of us do um, when we're doing this. What they found was that chronic load was actually significantly related to throwing injury occurrence. And you can see this chart that I took from the manuscript is a different quartiles. And I won't go into depth about you know, the, how they calculate all this, but when you get up into the 75th quartile and above, that's where the majority of their injuries occurred. This is actually very interesting because if you talk to some of our colleagues in Scandinavia with respect to handballers, they are usually of the mindset of, we would never shut a thrower down for three or four months as I've had discussions with them at, at international conferences, is they wanna maintain a high chronic workload so that you don't kind of stop and start, stop and start. I think one of the differences with baseball, especially, but also softball, is there's such high forces, such tremendous amount of torque about the shoulder and the elbow and rotational velocity that it's very different than almost any other uh, throwing sport. If you look at, for example, a football, American football quarterback, data from Dr. Fleissig's lab, and I don't know if actually if Dr. Wolf was on this paper a year ago, but you're about 2,000 degrees less uh, rotational velocity with a football throw compared to a baseball throw at the professional level. So that's a significant amount. So and because of all of this, uh, we started looking at this here at UF, and we developed a protocol that we were fortunate enough to get a grant uh, from OREF in honor of Dr. Andrews. And what we're doing now is we're taking the pitch counts, which we now have the data for. We want to use um, injury tracking prospectively like Dr. Meta's study, but instead of using any um, inertial device or a modus sleeve or anything else, we're using velocity intensity measurement. This study should have been done by 2021. So our three-year study has turned into a five-year study where we'll hopefully get three years of data thanks to COVID. Um, but basically what we have found so far, just kind of put a little bit of this up is the following, is we do have data from 2019 for about the first month of 2020 before everything was shut down in 2021. And we started looking at different variables, innings pitched, up to two innings, up to four innings, up to six innings, and the seventh inning. And for those you don't remember, at the high school level, uh, complete games are seven innings, not nine innings. We then uh, developed uh, different um, definitions, if you will. Something called workload percent. So we took our total game day pitches and multiplied by intensity. So you may ask, well, what's the intensity? There is no definition of intensity with respect to workload. So we came up with one. What we did or what we are doing is this. We are measuring preseason fastball velocity. And the example that we use is in blue below. So we measure the preseason velocity and then we measure the fastball velocity, the first 10 fastballs that should say in each inning that pitcher is throwing. And we divide that plain and simple. So if you can throw 90 miles an hour um, when you're doing your bullpen in the preseason and you're only throwing an average of 85, let's say 
in your game, unless you are injured, your intensity is only 85 out of 90. And then our total game day pitches we've already talked about before. So what we found so far is we're, we're up to almost 150 total pitcher outings with 42 pitchers, only four pitching related injuries. So it kind of goes similar to how Dr. Mehta's study where there's not a ton of pitching injuries, which must mean what we're telling everybody is, is good. It's just not good for our research. Our total game day pitch count had a pretty wide range, but the 219 was actually someone who really enjoyed, let's say, throwing in the bullpen. I think they had an A7 pitch bullpen. Um, the velocity ranged from pretty low to uh, the mid 80s, and most of the pitchers were in the upper 70s to low 80s. Intensity, which is something I was very curious about, you can see the range there, but the mean was 1.0. And remember, that basically means that folks are throwing as hard in the preseason as they are in the games with a very narrow standard deviation. So that our definition is working so far, knock on wood. So we did a little bit of some statistical um, calculations and we found that our total game day pitches is related significantly to workload percent. And then we found that there were significant differences between all innings groupings for total pitches and workload percent except once you start comparing the innings five to six to inning seven. That basically means is once you've gotten to the fifth inning, it doesn't matter anymore. You've already accumulated a significant amount of pitches. So what does this actually mean? So workload and pitch counts are associated. We need to gather more data. Down here in Florida, our season will start right after Valentine's Day. So if workload and injuries are significantly associated, then by extension, total game day pitch count would be a correlate for workload and injuries. So this monitoring system may lead to prevention of overuse injuries in high school baseball pitchers. If all that made you dizzy, this picture basically explains what I just said in the last couple of slides. Workload, workload, excuse me, should be connected to total game day pitch counts, which then should be correlated to injuries and all of the above. So that is what the hope is going forward. So in the end, and this is probably what's most important for your CAQ exam, whether you're talking about weighted balls and velocity measurement, whether you're talking about surgical intervention, orthobiologics, workload and train, which was the point of this talk, analytics and wearables, they are all connected. You have to understand that it's a multi-pronged approach. I usually say it's a three-pronged approach. I'm sure there's more prongs, but you have fatigue, threshold, pitch volume, workload, velocity, You've got connect, chain, training, and program analysis, biomechanics, and the evaluation and monitoring. And they all are interconnected. That's why this is very difficult when you're coming up with recommendations to make sure the evidence is actually a well-done study and it can be replicated. I will unshare. Uh, hopefully um, that was insightful. And now I uh, will turn it over to Dr. Will. Yep, Dr. Will, you're up. Yep, thank you. That was a uh, fantastic presentation. Um, really insightful as far as some of the things that we think about when we talk about injuries, to say the least. So my congratulations on all that work and good luck in the future. Um, so I'm going to talk about rehabilitation in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about from a youth baseball standpoint all the way up to uh, hopefully professional and uh, talk about some of the things we uh, are rehabilitation. These are my faculty disclosures of, of which I'll make sure none of them get involved in this pre uh, presentation. I want to thank Dr. Bowers for his kind invitation to have me present this evening. Um, one thing about webinars, these are great. You can watch them from anywhere. You can watch them from home or poolside. See this gentleman here. This is our facility in Birmingham, just to give you a little bit of uh, insight. Um, this is where physical and occupational therapy is. We have a biomechanics lab next door. And obviously, uh, baseball is a priority here. As was mentioned earlier, um, several um, individuals, Dr. Holtz in particular, you know, when we think about overhead athletes, uh, many times we think about throwers, but certainly there's other overhead athletes that uh, many times have problems with their shoulders and their elbows. So my, uh, my quest in the next 19 minutes talk about injury trends a little bit, how it's changing, a little bit on risk, how it relates to rehabilitation. Um, but I really want to talk about things that you can apply uh, tomorrow morning or Monday morning, whenever you go back to work, 
as far as a return to play criteria testing and what's new in rehab and youth baseball players, as well as uh, more experienced. So hopefully I'll give you a sense of direction. A lot of the exercises and some of the tests are on my Instagram and um, you can view those and we try to use that for patients as well. A couple uh, shameful plugs here this uh, Saturday, uh, I'll be doing a Grand Rounds presentation with Dr. Kibler, who a lot of you know Dr. Ben Kibler is. He's probably the uh, individual that you know, brought to the scapula to light for all of us uh, some 20, 30 years ago, probably 30 years ago, actually. So Dr. Kibler and I are going to talk about the scapula. It's a free webinar. It's about an hour long. It's designed uh, for presentation and cases. Also at ASMI here in Birmingham, American Sports Medicine Institute, uh, we'll be having our baseball course next week. It's uh, the 26th through the 28th. It's gonna be virtual this year because of uh, the pandemic and the outbreak that we're all experiencing because of, of uh, COVID. Here in Birmingham, we're interested in pros, but we're also interested in kids. And certainly uh, kids get hurt at a high rate, which you've heard already. You know, throwing a baseball, pitching that is, generates uh, tremendous angular velocities. And what Dr. Fleissig has documented here in Birmingham, over 7,000 degrees per second, about half body weight trying to dislocate your shoulder out the front, and then the deceleration phase, about one times body weight. We look at studies that were done here and other places, really the angular velocity, lead pitcher, even to a youth player, is pretty close. Their arms are moving about the same speed, but the difference is the linear velocity and certainly the ball velocity. Youth players generally are around 55 to 60 miles per hour. We're pros now on an average is 90, 92, 93, and some even exceed 103. Windmill style pitching certainly gener generates a lot of force. Dr. Holtz mentioned this already, ball velocity up to 77 uh, miles per hour, which is fantastic. But you notice the angular velocity at the shoulder is much less than uh, the overhead throw. And if you're interested in the comparison, uh, pro to youth and everything in between, uh, Fleissig in the Journal of Biomechanics uh, in 99 uh, talked about this quite a bit. Most of the injuries we see are to pitchers, unfortunately, about two thirds. Uh, and there's a lot of different reasons as was alluded to. So about 50 to 75% of all injuries are to the shoulder and the elbow. Sometimes they're mechanical and some of these pitchers have um, some distorted mechanics from time to time. Um, sometimes it's related to just ball release and velocity, if you will. Some are related to training errors. As you see this windmill style pitcher, uh, maybe hung on to the ball just a, a little bit too long. Here at uh, ASMI, we have a nice biomechanics lab that uh, Dr. Fleissig has run for some years and published numerous papers. We use marker but also markerless biomechanical analysis. And we look at pitchers and we've studied football players as well. This you might find interesting. Um, this is some unpublished work by myself where uh, we looked at a series of baseball players three years. The end is like 2000 and something, believe it or not. We have about 198 female windmill style pitchers, generally at the high school and uh, college levels. And if you notice, the range of motion is dramatically different, um, in particular, internal rotation, external rotation is pretty close. But look at the total arc of motion between female windmill style pitchers and male baseball. Pitchers. Uh, it's almost 20 degrees difference. Also shoulder flexion, uh, 193. You might say, well, how did you get 193? We actually had their shoulder sitting on the edge of the table and examined them. So this is all passive range of motion. So obviously that wind pitcher has a tremendous amount of motion they go through. One of the things that we're noticing with injuries is at the professional ranks, we're seeing more elbows than shoulders ever before. Uh, from 98 to 07, the ratio was two to one shoulder to elbow. And now it's completely reversed. It's two to one elbow to shoulder. But what's the reasons for that? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, youth baseball players, some, some work that's been done here, up to 74% of all youth baseball players between the ages of 8 and 18 reported arm pain during playing during the season. About 50% were encouraged to continue to play. And many of these youth individuals, as Dr. Lyman pointed out, um, actually uh, pitch consecutive days. 
So what is, you know, the rate, if you will? Well, a lot of the exercise I'll show you in a few minutes is we try to bring the entire body into the equation. And this has been alluded to by our, our previous presenters, Dr. Bauer, Dr. Liu, Dr. Zbeski. They've all said the same thing that, you know, weak hips and scapula and um, scapular dyskinesis, all these things can come into play and cause problems. So we need to evaluate uh, the entire body, really from the foot all the way up to the, the fingertips. Um, and, and a paradox, if you will, is we tell individuals that pitchers need to be loose enough to throw, but stable enough to prevent symptoms. So you're kind of walking that tightrope, if you will. And there is a big difference, if you will, between youth players and professional, if you will. Uh, youth players, we think, generally get hurt because they pitch too much. Just what you've heard previously from Jason. Jason did a fantastic job looking at workload, which is really the crux of the issue. It's not really pitch count. It's your warm-ups, how much you're throwing on the side. All these things have a cumulative effect. So I really congratulate him on his work at dissecting this. Uh, pitching when fatigue gives you a 36 times greater injury. Not enough rest between a fresk at the end of the season. Specialization. Nowadays, kids come in, they're 12 years old, and they're only pitchers. They're not even playing baseball. They are pitchers. And so specialization has gone on to professionalization. And then we have improper throwing mechanics, which I wish I'd uh, show you some of this, but Dr. Holtz did a great job talking about this already. And then improper training and conditioning. We'll talk about weighted balls in a second. So here's an example of the run and gun. So baseballs are 5.5 ounces. So what people have come up with are balls that weigh more or less. And there has been work done on this way back in the 80s by Coop Duran from the University of Hawaii. They basically pointed out by throwing weighted balls, overweight or underweight, you can increase velocity. And that's what everybody's after right now, throwing hard. So this gentleman has generated a tremendous amount of force, especially when he's running into it especially with a ball that maybe weighs nine or 12 ounces. This is called the rocker, if you will. We are rocking back and forth. And again, these balls come in various weights, all the way up to 32 ounces in some cases. So instead of throwing a five ounce baseball, 5.5, they're throwing something six times greater. Well, does it really matter? This is a study by Mike Reinhold up in Boston. This is published in Journal of Sports Health. He had 34 male high school baseball players, a mean age 15, randomly assigned to one or two groups, weighted ball and a control group. And the weighted ball group threw for six weeks balls that weighed from two ounces underweight all the way up to 32 ounces. They did increase their velocity at the end of the six weeks by about 4%, which has been substantiated by numerous others. The problem is for injuries, 25% of the study group were injured, either in the study or immediately thereafter. Three UCL injuries and one electron stress fracture. The other aspect of this in the second part of the study that Mike Reinhold did is to elucidate why he thought these injuries occurred. And he felt as though the injury occurred because it increased their range of motion, in particular, external rotation. This has been pointed out before that two 16-year-olds many times don't look alike. Physiologically, they look different. And obviously, sometimes even psychologically or from a mental aspect. What about more the elite thrower, the collegiate or professional? Why do they get hurt more frequently? Well, we think it's velocity. Velocity, and actually at the shoulder, the excessive ER is actually good for your shoulder, the retroversion, but it's bad for your elbow. So you're more likely to sustain an elbow injury with more ER. Uh, pitching when fatigue, poor throwing mechanics, and actually if you were born and grew up in a warm climate, it's been shown that you have a higher rate of UCL injuries. That's been pointed out by Erickson and Chalmers as well. Throwing hard is bad. And again, people are interested in velocity, coaches. I hear from college coaches all the time. They're interested in somebody who throws 89, 92, long levers, tall individuals. They can teach control, teach them how to pitch. They can't teach velocity. Here's some data from Major League Baseball looking at the average fastball velocity over a 10-year period from 08 to 2018. And velocity has gradually increased with a couple plateaus. Look at the number of Tommy John surgeries, UCL reconstructions as well. 
And there's a lot of different reasons for that probably, but it almost mirrors this, the increase in velocity as well. So what about rehab? Um, when I see a younger person, uh, when I say younger, high school, maybe even younger, a lot of times, you know, they have shoulder pain. Maybe they have little leaguer shoulder, little leaguer's elbow, apophysitis. Um, and really what I'm looking at is their entire body. I put them on a lower extremity strengthening program, hip and core, control their scapula, address their throwing mechanics, and gradually get them back to throwing. The elite level, it's really more fine tuned we're looking at imbalances and range of motion, strength. A lot of times in the more mature thrower, it's tissue degradation. So we're trying to regenerate tissue as well. So let's get into some specifics. People start physical therapy, they expect immediate response, right? They want one visit, you've solved my problem. And that's not gonna happen on a regular basis. Keys to success for me is specific diagnosis, from you as a physician, also identifying involved structures and treating the causative factors that have been elucidated prior. Normalizing motion, the balance between internal and external rotation, improving posture. Historically, throwers have horrible posture, especially young people. Tight anterior, pec minor, as Dr. Bowers talked about, a lot of thoracic outlet-like symptoms and working on dynamic control of the humeral head. So we look at force couple or balance of muscle forces, ERIR ratio, deltoid ER ratio, scapular ratios as well, and definitely legs because over 63% of the kinetic energy is coming from your legs and your hip in the overhead throw and probably greater than that with windmill style. So where do we start? Well, I learned through the years, I've worked with Dr. Andrews here in Birmingham for the last uh, oh, 32, 33 years. Thrower's shoulders aren't normal when we talk about more professional ranks or high level collegiate. If their MRI is normal, they're probably not very good, unfortunately. Motion imbalances exist. GERD is only one piece of the puzzle. It's not the smoking gun. The smoking gun is a combination of factors, total arc of motion horizontal adduction, even flexion. We did an eight-year prospective study that documented the number one risk factor regarding range of motion for injury at the elbow was loss of shoulder flexion. That was followed by increase in ER. Internal rotation did not correlate. Hips and core training is critical, more than just shoulder strengthening and proper throwing training programs. Weighted balls are okay, they just need to be supervised and controlled. Long distance throwing is okay, but not everyone can throw 300 feet. This is a study we did with the Rays back in 2000. 31 asymptomatic uh, baseball players were MRI'd. These were pitchers, by the way. 90% had abnormalities on their labrum, 87% on their rotator cuff, about 40% actually had cystic changes on the bone. This study was also uh, substantiated by Miniachi as well. Let me spend a couple minutes on criteria to return the throwing. We have criteria for ACL patients, and we found that establishing objective criteria decreases the rate of re-injuries in ACLs in particular. I believe that would be true for baseball players as well. So what do we look at? Well, we wrote a paper on this in the International Journal of Sports PT. Myself, Mike Bagwell, George Davies, and Chris Arrigo, and that was published in 2020. We said, look at range of motion. Look at all ranges, IR, ER, not just internal rotation. Check it at 90 degrees. Check it at 45 degrees. Take a look at shoulder flexion. Take a look at shoulder horizontal adduction as well. Definitely clinical exam, your favorite special tests. Um, different physicians have different favorite tests, to say the least. Muscle strength. In the past, we've published papers on isokinetics, but it's costly, it's time consuming. And nowadays I really use more handheld dynamometry, but we still do isokinetics under certain circumstances and have published several papers on that. Have the blood done appropriate rehab? Our big caveat is you will not start a throwing program or return back to play without doing plyometrics two-hand plyos and one-hand plyos. And you need to do that for several weeks 
to gradually prepare your tissue for the stresses of throwing. This gives you an example of what we want you to do prior to throwing. Because that's a two pound ball. He throws it up against the wall, he gets all the way back in end range ER. We do a rhythmic stabilization. Dynamic stabilization exercises, these are called ball drops where the person lays on the table, two pound ball, and they release and catch the ball. It's a 30 second test and we count the number of catches as the person we just tested yesterday. His 30 second ball drop uh, equated to 114 ball drops and catches. Then we would do this on their non-throwing shoulder. What are we looking at? We're looking at fatigue. We're looking at how does your shoulder respond to this? How do you feel afterwards? Are you sore the next day? All these things would be three trials. We take the mean of the three. You can see when this gentleman gets done with 30 seconds, he's pretty tired. <laughs> and he'll do this on his un uninvolved or non-throwing non shoulder as well. You would think it would be a big discrepancy. We're actually looking for, if you're coming back from injury, 90% or greater, but the normal is usually a, about 10% greater. The other one is throws up against the wall. This is a two pound ball. He throws in as fast and as fast as possible. And we count the number of throws. This gives you an idea of what it looks like. He's actually releasing that ball. So we're looking at arm position. Does it change? How much ER does he have? Does he have any discomfort? And obviously the number of taps on the wall. Then we back you up 20 feet. Why 20 feet? Because there's a wall here and we can't go any further. That's a one pound ball and we have you throw toward the target. Hitting the target, we don't count. We just take a look at your mechanics just superficially. We've tested to date 181 healthies, uh, 93 UCL reconstructions. Also what was mentioned was lower extremity. So we do a single uh, squat. We do this for time, 30 seconds you in your office. Young people are horrible at this because they're weak and they're hip abductors. Hip abduction, has correlated with throwing mechanics alteration. It's also correlated to ball, ball velocity. So if you want to increase your velocity, you get your hips stronger. That's what I tell kids, even though personally, I'm not that interested in, in velocity. Uh, core, I noticed one of the questions was, is there a way of testing core in the office? It's called the Planck test. There's numerous data points on this. When we do it in our clinic, we actually have a little sensor. So, we put this little belt on, it has a little sensor, and as soon as his spine moves that segment at T12, the test would be over, it interfaces with a, uh, with a phone. With competitive athletes, they'll get very competitive with these tests. We also do a subjective uh, score as well. All right, last two minutes. What are we doing different with rehab exercise? Here's a young man, he's 12, 13 years of age. He's doing his band exercises. And you know, today for me, that's not good enough. It's like laying on the table and doing exercises. So now we want them to lunge, get into a lunge position, use your resistance bands so you don't have to use dumbbells. So you can do this at the ballpark. Uh, you can do this in the gym, but we wanna get your legs engaged. We wanna get your core of your body engaged when you do the exercise. We do a variety of these exercises like on a stability ball or even side planking or in a lunge position when he's doing his external rotation. Many of these young people cannot do a side plank. They're weak in the core. Um, so we have them do half planks. Here he's doing a rowing motion in the upper left where he's in a squat position. Stability balls are great because it brings the core of the body into the equation. It brings a rector spinae, but it's also a bilateral exercise. So with our youth, youth baseball players, we're trying to do more single leg stance, single leg movements. We're trying to bring the core of the body into the equation more prone exercise, like you see this young man here. His legs, he can't maintain that position. He's dropping down to the table. Single leg balance. A lot of these individuals just have poor body awareness and they're propelling their body toward home plate when they're pitching. So we're trying to get them to center their mass, work on the rotational force and drive from the ground up. This is a classic example. We're in a squat position and he's gonna do 10, 15 reps. Endurance is critical. When he fatigues, his injury rate goes up. So we want him to up the repetitions with all these exercises. He can squat during this or do a, a like a lunging type of motion as well. 
posture a young man like this probably uses a backpack probably plays video games uh, and probably has poor posture so we try to address that as well a lot of single leg drills like you see here and look at look at this person's body position body control as he does it his legs wobble his arms are moving around dramatically different than that gentleman I showed previously uh, who was a professional baseball pitcher. And then last couple of things to summarize, in young people, we tell them we want you to play another sport. Rest your arm from throwing. We want you to rest for about three months after your season is over. Play another sport like soccer or basketball so your arm recovers. We have a little league throwers program that we have it's available through ASMI. We made a video on this just recently. Uh, you can go to ASMI.org for that. In summary, we also have a Throwers 10 program that was published in um, Physical Mass and Rehabilitation uh, a few years back in 2016. We also have an advanced Throwers 10, so we try to progress the exercises. We also have um, a uh, Volleyball 10 program specific for the vo volleyball player. And we also have a softball windmill style pitch. So with that, I, I know there's some questions I wanna end and, uh, and leave some time for, for questions. So I really appreciate your kind attention and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thanks Dr. Wilk, that was great. Um, I wish we had, uh, could give you another hour to talk. Um, so, so I think, um, Inevitably, with uh, with five speakers, we were going to go over time. So I think that that was just bound to bound to happen. Um, so we we do have some questions in the chat um, that that I'll ask, and then we can just have a discussion as well. We don't necessarily have a have a hard cut off, and so we can just have a um, a discussion. And so I'll go to the first question that we see in the chat, and then if any attendees want to put questions in the chat. Uh, just throw them in there and then, then I'll ask them as they come up. And so uh, Dr. Holtz, the first question that came up, are there any tips for assessing an athlete's kinetic chain in an office setting besides for, aside from just testing for glute med weakness? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think a squat, one leg squat, side plank are all, you know, um, really great kind of static office tests. I like to look at the athlete's video you know, and just get a sense for, are they able to balance dynamically within their pitching motion? Um, there's some evidence for the Y balance test. It's worth looking up that um, test and it's been used in overhead athletes. Um, but in a, like a fast paced sports medicine clinic, that would be a challenging test to put, you know, an athlete through that, that appears to be more of a you know, physical therapy assessment tool. Um, uh, but I'd be curious to hear what the, what others on the panel use. And Dr. Wilk, what would you say if, as far as, you know, quick tests to, to assess kind of kinetic chain in throwers that could reasonably, you think maybe be done in the office setting for, for a position to do? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you have to be practical about it. So that single leg squat, I think is the way to go. I would recommend make sure you put a chair behind because you'd be surprised how many kids actually, you know, just tip over uh, or next to a wall where they can rest their hand. The other way you can do is in, in the overhead throw, they can come up in the balance position. So actually simulate um, like a wind up and they would come in on their single leg and come up and ask them to balance for about two seconds and then just stop. Um, I don't really know how to reproduce something like that in windmill style pitchers. I think, you know, unfortunately, we're really deficient in that area uh, for windmill style pitchers. That's something that's a really a big interest of mine here is to develop more screenings and more programs for those individuals. Yeah, um, Dr. Wilk, I can say that, you know, the test where you're balancing on on your back leg is one that I've used in you know, from eight-year-olds to 22-year-old softball pitchers as a pitching coach, you know, before my medical career. And, and that was always a good screening for me, whether or not, you know, I felt like they were going to run into trouble because, uh, you know, after the stride and you're just balancing on your back leg, I think Gretchen Oliver's work would support that at that position. If your glute needs weak, you're just going to land early, rotate your shoulders, and then, you know, horses out of the barn. So I think 
you know, I, it's hilarious. I'm telling you, you're on the right track. Clearly you're on the right track <laughs> with, um, you know, asking athletes to balance on one leg. Okay. So um, got a second question from, from Anthony who's actually directed it to me and he's asking just what denervation changes would be typical in the muscles and in quadrilateral space syndrome that I might see on MRI. So you can see it on ultrasound too. Uh, you're basically, you're going to look at the deltoid and so you can get a good look at the deltoid on ultrasound and, and you'll just see a decrease in muscle bulk. And so, especially for, for quadrilateral space, you'll see that that muscle bulk of the deltoid will will come down and, and something that when it has become more chronic in a, in, you know, an earlier stage, then you may not see that, that decreased muscle bulk. There's a good picture in that um, ultrasound study that, that was in my talk on, on quadrilateral space syndrome of a side-by-side -side picture of ultrasound of a, a normal patient. And then one with quadrilateral space and you see that, that decreased muscle bulk of the deltoids. So, um, so that's, that's what you're going to focus on, on imaging. And Alan has a question, and I think this really could go, go to anyone, maybe Dr. Zaremski, uh, regarding the pitching studies, has there been any research looking into the load force um, on the ligaments, whether it be shoulder or elbow, comparing fastballs and breaking balls? So I always get the nice controversial ones. Um, <laughs> right. So not necessarily the specific ligaments per se, but the joints and a lot of this will depend. Uh, you know, obviously Dr. Um, Wilkes colleague, Dr. Plysik is probably the world expert on this, but the short answer is yes. And um, what we used to believe, and I think Dr. Andrews gave the line is you shouldn't throw a curveball until you can shave. Uh, his thing is the line. And as a redhead, I think I couldn't throw a curveball until I was 20 then. But um Basically, what they found is that there's actually um, not as much stress from throwing a curveball as there is from throwing a fastball, to be quite honest, with respect to your shoulder and your elbow. Um, so it actually changes the um, thought process a little bit. You know, we still, you know, I still say this, the best pitch in baseball in strike one, I'm not your pitching coach, but he or she would probably like that. So I, I, I still really recommend to our younger athletes that even though the data suggests that there is a little bit more stress when you're throwing a fastball, it, and this is a study actually done by Dr. Plastic's team uh, where they looked over seven years, is if you learn appropriate and good biomechanics before you go through puberty, that once you go through puberty and, puberty and develop that power, if you're throwing the right way, there is a less likelihood that you're going to have abnormal forces or torques or strains on different parts of your body. So again, it's, it's one of those that the short answer to the question is yes, there is data on that. There's biomechanical data on that. And it's not what I think at least those of us are probably 35 or 40 and older were told growing up, but you have to then go back to the concept of if we get to these athletes when they're young, prepubescent, and they develop good biomechanical habits, the likelihood that they will develop them once they have gone through the period of maturation where they can throw harder means there's less likelihood that they'll have um, abnormal forces on the shoulder or elbow other than from a chronic workload perspective. That was a long-winded way to answer that yes, there's data on it. Yeah, no, that was great. That's literally the same thoughts I have just articulated much better than I could have done. So um, let's see here, run through, you had already answered that one in the, in the chat. Um, oh, and then Dr. Wilk. So uh, Charles Kinney, who's actually one of our fellows here, here at Emory, uh, has a question for you. He says, uh, I've always been impressed with the close relationships between physicians and therapy team, biomechanists at ASMI, any tips for physicians in optimizing communication with therapists and overhead athletes? Yeah, just spend time with one another. Um, so, you know, we're fortunate here where the fellows uh, will come in, uh, the primary care sports medicine docs, as well as the orthopedists. And we do rounds together. We see patients together. And so there's that exchange of information and insights. Uh, we also do teaching conferences together. But I think, uh, you know, just sitting down and talking about it with patients, uh, about patients, I should say, with case studies is really the way to go. Um, 
So, you know, that would be my two cents on that. And I agree. I think that's something better that we could probably do um, here at, at Emory is, is incorporating more of a team-based approach in, in grain rounds and things like that, which we do from time to time, but probably just not as well as, well as we could. Um, so, Dr. Holtz, another question for you. In your opinion, do you think we should be limiting pitch counts for softball pitchers similar to baseball? Yeah, that's another controversial question. Um, yeah, I do. Should it be the same pitch counts? Maybe not. But should there be a limit on innings pitched for uh, travel ball, you know, high school uh, age travel ball pitchers and um, maybe even pitchers in, in uh, NCAA um, or university? Yeah, I, I do. Mostly because the evidence shows that um, most softball pitchers are throwing uh, with arm pain. 70% uh, of collegiate uh, softball pitchers um, have uh, arm pain or history of an overuse injury. Um, and if you look over the course of a travel ball tournament, pitchers um, report arm fatigue um, and pain and a loss of strength. So there's something going on when pitching is not, you know, capped or limited. Um, in a way that we haven't really captured um, in softball like we have in baseball, just because there's more research interest in baseball. So I definitely think there's an opportunity to reduce the number of overuse injuries in softball, reduce the number of kids throwing in pain, maybe extend people's career um, and um, you know ability to pitch, pitch um, effectively over the course of a season. You know, everyone likes to glorify that like one starter um, who, you know, carries a team through the women's college world series, but like maybe that, that pitcher would actually be even better if they had some limitations near the end, you know, throughout the course of the year. So yes, but I don't know how, but I'm, you know, it sure would be nice if, if someone funded that, that research. Yeah. If I could jump in, I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, we're involved with the university of Alabama and Auburn university as well. And uh, many times, you know, we see these young ladies after the fact. Um, so maybe they compete and they've had some shoulder problems once the tournaments are over. Um, you know, sometimes they go to the World Series, fortunately. But, you know, two years later, they're resurfacing with bicep complaints, subacromial impingement complaints, supraspinated complaints, just soreness around their shoulder from just getting beat up. And some are coaching, but some are even out of softball and having problems. Some of that could be deconditioning, but I, I'm a firm believer that that's an area we need to get a pitch count on. And, and again, you know, I know that word pitch count, <laughs> you know, is a tough word, but uh, some type of way of monitoring workload, like Jason was talking about earlier, I, I think I think it's brilliant. Is, is really a concept. So <clears throat> we'll see if let's see. So Dr. Jenovsky, it, it kind of already mentioned this, it's just a treatment question and, and just that it, it wasn't discussed. Um, uh, and maybe Dr. Liu, if you have any questions, if you came across or, or answers, maybe you, you came across this, but um, Nate was just ask, asking if there's any luck in treating valgus extension overload syndrome non-operatively or if arthroscopy is, is typically needed for these patients. I have, excuse me, I haven't really come across um, many of these cases, so I can't really comment. Yeah, um, and, and I think my, my thought was the same as, as Dr. Zaremski. You know, it, it kind of depends on what the imaging looks like. Are there, is there a big old bone spur there that, you know, that might warrant needing arthroscopy? But, um, but I, I think the, again, <laughs> the, the answer is, it depends uh, based on if, if that's the diagnosis that you come down to. Um, you know, the other thing, Dr. Bowers, is, you know, for us, yeah. and, you know, quite a bit of elbows, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you know, you, you want to think UCL until proven otherwise. That's kind of my, my motto because uh, the valgus extension overload is happening for a reason that osteophyte on the posterior medial aspect. So you want to clear your UCL very carefully, do a valgus extension overload test, see how symptomatic they are. Many times it's a bony reaction. So sometimes stopping throwing 
working on, you know, everything we talked about mechanics when they start back, maybe the decelerators at the elbow, biceps as well, but try to work flexor pronator mass just from a stabilization standpoint on the medial side. It gives them a chance. Does it always work? I have no idea, but it's something we try in the clinic in hopes to avoid, you know, taking down that osteophyte because sometimes going down that road is not a good road because that leads to UCL later, right? <laughs> and so, uh, especially if a little bit too much bone is taken down. Um, so valgus extension overload can be a, a big problem. It's the, sometimes the beginning of a bigger problem. That's an outstanding insight. Um, so uh, Eddie uh, Deggerman, so I remember him interviewing for fellowship with us. He was a former um, high-level collegiate baseball pitcher and, and uh, pitched in pro ball for several years. Um, so he, he says, great idea to monitor and, and try to track accumulation of pitches and intensity of bullpen and warm-up pitches. Could throwing during practice, playing log toss during non-game days, um, even come into the question of being able to track that? So, so the short answer is yes, and it's been done. Dr. Mehta, actually, uh, the study that I referenced that just came out, he had a, I think it was a poster presentation, actually, from a couple of years ago. But I think his group was one of the groups. Um, there's also another group out of Washington State called uh, Driveline, which is a big baseball research facility. I'm not sure if their data technically is Evans Base published, but they publish a lot of stuff online. Um, also does that where you're, you're monitoring lots of throws. The thing you have to be aware of is there has to be con some consistency. So if you measure long toss with 50% max perceived effort and you're throwing 120 feet, well, if you do that on Tuesday, are you then taking a day off and you're doing that consistently? So it's one of those things like if you go to the gym on J January 1st and you lift and you feel great and you're sore the next day and you don't do anything for a week, you just kind of lost what you did there versus if you're doing something every other day. So the, the short answer is yes, you absolutely can monitor that, whether it's through meticulous pitch counting or throw counting with interns or with uh, some of these uh, special devices like a modus sleeve or other, other devices that are available out there. Um, but then the question is, what do you do with that? I mean, you have to be aware that just playing catch, you know, well, you got to look at the forces or how hard you're throwing and how it was the distance. So there's, there's it, again, the devil's in the details. But yeah, you absolutely can do it. But that's why these studies are so hard to, um, to really put into play, um, to really bad, use a bad cliche, because what are you going to do with that data? You have to, you know, again, you got to add in everything from that. And that's where knowing your biomechanics, your effort, your velocity are, are all really important. Definitely. Um... So there aren't any other questions in the, in the chat function. Does anyone else have any comments or, or parting thoughts? So um, thanks so much for, for everyone for doing this. Um, as I mentioned, you know, inevitably we're going to go um, over time. Um, the, the symposia and this discussion and everybody's talks will be posted on AMSSM's YouTube page here fairly quickly. And so anyone can, can go back and rewatch, please. If, if you, um, you know, if you liked any of the talks, please direct people to the, the, to the YouTube page to who watch these. And as, as Dr. Wilk had said, the injuries in baseball course, which begins on January 26th is a, is a great course. I've, I've, uh, gone to it several times over the last several years. So for those that are interested, maybe particularly in the throwing athlete, especially in baseball, it's a great course to attend if you have that, um, if you have that interest. But uh, with that said, um, I'd like to thank again, everyone for, um, for speaking, every part, everybody on the panel. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming in and providing their insight. So thanks again, and uh, everyone have a good night. Thank you. Enjoyed right. it. Take care. Get some sleep, Dr. Lou. Thanks for organizing. <laughs> Will do. Thanks, everybody. Right.